Hello and welcome to Building Your T-Shirt Empire. My name's Cole and with me as always is Gavin. So today we have a great guest. We have Marshall Atkinson, um, known from Atkinson Consulting and so many other projects that he works on. Marshall, why don't you take over and let the people know what it is you do on a daily basis? Yeah, well, I'm an industry uh, coach, right? So what I do is I help people clarify uh, and untangle their problems, right? And so that could be a business problem or a leadership issue or they worried about their pricing or how they want to uh, make more money. So we work on a cost optimization project. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things. Um, kind of my superpower, I think, is um, that I don't necessarily have all the right answers, but I'm very well connected. And in about a text message or an email, I have the right issue of, or, or right answer if I don't know the answer. Um, but I've been doing this for a long time, and um, everything I do is custom to the, the shop and what's going on. And uh, so it's really about helping people get to the, their next level or achieve their goals uh, by um, really working and brainstorming and questioning and challenging. And, and as Gavin will tell you, I ask a million questions. <laughs> right? So it's all about unraveling the truth behind, behind things. And some people don't know why they're doing something or why they think about something or that type of thing. And so you really have to kind of unearth that and dig around a little bit in that. And then we can discover what the next steps might be and where the quicksand is on that. And we can talk all about outcomes and stuff, right? So um, that's kind of what what's going on, right? And so I have a consulting business. That's my Atkinson Consulting. And I also have another project that I do called Shirt Lab, which is all about training for the industry, mostly in sales and marketing, although we do do some production stuff. We have a mastermind group called Shirt Lab Tribe. And then we do... Uh, are either virtual or in-person events. And we have an in-person event coming up at the end of July here uh, in New Orleans with a fantastic lineup. And uh, we do at least one of those a year. Uh, 2019, we lost our minds and did four events. I don't know what we oh, were no. thinking then, <laughs> but um, that's what's going on. And so, um, so anyway, so that's what I do. And uh, I'm all about helping people. And my latest project is all about understanding artificial intelligence with the MidJourney platform. And so there's a lot of uh, creative AI out there, you know, Stable Diffusion and Dolly and, you know, whatever. And MidJourney, I think, is giving uh, the best images. And uh, it it's very um, quirky and hard to use a little bit. I mean, it lives on Discord. Uh, it's word based and so your words really matter uh, and uh, it's not as intuitive as you think it is. And so I have a um, newsletter that I built. I'm an ex art director, so I think about art constantly. So it's really about how professionals, creatives are using the platform to iterate and create faster and get the results that they want. Uh, and uh, so that's kind of. Uh, what's going on with that? And I've been exploring Midjourney uh, for several months. And um, a fun project I do for myself is I create using Midjourney daily for up to 15 minutes, and then whatever the best image of that exercise is, I post that on my social media and share nice. what's going on. And I try to do that every day. And a lot of the images I post is like five minutes of work, and here it is. Yeah. Um, some take a little longer and I'm re-rolling and iterating and doing some different things, but it's kind of an exercise I'm using and I'm teaching myself the different prompts and what that effect, those words, what the end result is. And by just doing that 10 or 15 minutes a day allows me to uh, learn the program, right? So it's kind of, kind of a, a, a journey. Mid journey, journey. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we're using it. it. We're using it now for like our covers on YouTube and stuff, um, where we're using it to create like interesting covers, and then we're doing face swaps on top of them. Right. Um, and so it, I've been playing with it quite a bit. What I've found is it has limitations to the amount of parameters that it will pay attention to before it just starts ignoring everything. 
Yeah, um, it's uh, it's so around if, sixty words. Yeah, so if you start telling it, you know, it, you know, there's seven people, and this person is wearing a red shirt, and this person's wearing a blue shirt. At some point, it just starts spitting out random images that aren't what you're describing. Yeah. Um, and so the interesting thing I've found is using it kind of as a way to give customers a bunch of baseline options. And then once they have those baseline options, they can then, you know, that can get turned into something that you can vectorize or you can, you know, at least not waste your time with sketching. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, the best thing to do is, uh, is remember that mid-journey is not Photoshop. And mm -hmm. uh, the more specific you are with the prompt, uh, the least likely that you could actually find the result that you want. So if you're wanting seven people and they're each wearing something different, it's probably better to do seven different images of mid-journey and just throw it all into Photoshop because it's going to take you less time to curate that image, right? So you could, uh, like I did an experiment where I was doing a uh, T-shirt for a fake a uh, restaurant bar called the Green Iguana Tequila Bar, right? And I created the iguana and then the background and then the shots of tequila and then a texture to put into the type. I created yeah. all that mid-journey, threw it into Photoshop and separated it. And it's like maybe 20, 25, 30 minutes of work, right? Yeah, and absolutely. if we did all that in mid-journey, you would be re-rolling to the cows come home you wouldn't be right. happy with it. It was just easier to do it all in pieces and just assemble it, right? And uh, so that's kind of a better way of using that, so. And speaking of Photoshop, I mean, I don't know if you've loaded up the Photoshop beta with all of the AI generation of in that. Yes. But that, uh, that's pretty amazing, the way you can like select individual people, change, you can literally change outfits on existing photographs. All that stuff's really mm -hmm. fascinating to see it evolve. And I'm sure that's Midjourney's real threat is Adobe just getting so good that there's no reason for Midjourney. Um, well, I don't know about that because Adobe is, of course, trained on the Adobe uh, world, right? And mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily on other things, right? So if you wanted to do a 1969 Camaro, right, Adobe might not have that image, right? Or, uh, you know, uh, other things, right? So... Adobe gives you what it gives you. And I think Midjourney, the, the power of that is the fact that it's uh, any image that it has access to on the internet, which is billions of images and image yeah. pairs. And, uh, you know, I've played around with Photoshop, generative fill and stuff, and it, it does great. It does a great job. But is it making that uh, tie dye butterfly like you want? you know, or whatever. I mean, and um, it, it gives you what it gives you. And I think the power of mid journey is that it iterates really quickly and you can just change a couple words or re-roll or now it's got some just amazing things where it's, uh, you can zoom and move things around and, uh, and, uh, and knowing how things work. Uh, and also you can select uh, Pantone colors if you know how to do that, that's something I discovered last week <laughs> was how to do Pantone yeah. colors in mid journey. Uh, it's, there's a process. You just have to know how to do it. Right. So, um, have you found uh, one of the things that I've found with mid journey is it's outputting things, um, that are basically just kind of classic HD. Um, is there an AI upscaler that you prefer right now? I've played with yeah. a lot of them and they all seem to have their ups and downs. I like gigapixel. Gigapixel. Is that yeah. one paid or free? It's paid, but most of the tools yeah, that are worth worth a darn you have to pay for. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and um, so I like Gigapixel. I use it daily. Uh, it'll take, you know, when you get your download, your mid-journey file, it's like a 1028 by 1028 and 72 DPI. Uh, yeah. Gigapixel blows it up to be a 72 DPI file, but it's 54 inches square. So you can Jeez. resample that to a 300 DPI file. 15 or 16 images, I mean, uh, inches, right? And it'll be uh, 105 megs of file. I mean, and it's super clean and crisp, perfect for what we do, right? And um, and you can start playing around with it uh, in your, whatever you know, Affinity or Photoshop or whatever you use. And you can start playing with that from there and you have a great source file to use. Very cool. 
Yeah, I mean, Gavin, you're you're in the art space too. What have you been seeing with people trying to implement AI art versus just um, you know building it out of either clip art libraries or building it from scratch? Yeah, yeah. Actually, Marshall and I we are in conversation with the Mid Journey uh, from our end. Our most of our most of our customers they're coming in with pre-ready art, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and our business is set up mainly to take care of. Uh, those type of those type of uh, files, uh, but we do get some one-offs like uh, somebody want a super high-end simulator process. But our customers, from what I'm seeing, like not a not a lot of our customers are taking advantage of that. At least right now, um, there are again some one-off jobs that just come in, uh, and the way we're set up is like. Because we've uh, we've we've tried to we've tried to go down that rabbit hole, and we hesitated a little bit. We tried again and hesitated, and it has to kind of fit. It has to m at least make business sense for us, uh, mm -hmm. and to be able to dedicate somebody to just like fully just do that. Uh, I just haven't seen it yet, so that's why I I've been kind of just really reluctant to just go down that without like investing a lot of time and money into it yeah without seeing the result I mean, like money wise and the thing is like a lot of our um a lot of our business ends up being vectorized artwork um that's what most graphics end up being and so i guess you could take something out of mid journey and then live trace it or something in illustrator but marshall have you heard Ooh. or seen anything that has to do with ai vectors is that even a thing yet uh, I was looking at something the other day. What was it? Um, there's a program called Kittle, K-I-T-T-L, which okay. uh, has uh, vector templates and stuff with it and is a way to create art for an AI, and you can upload things. And, and uh, it's a pretty interesting program. I messed around with it for, like, maybe five minutes. Um but I'll tell you what, I, I'm a big believer, and you absolutely don't need vector art for T-shirts. Uh, mm -hmm. You can separate using channels in Photoshop and get a super cream, mm -hmm. clean, crisp edge. Uh, like, to me, I wouldn't bother vectorizing an image because I know how to separate it. Like, I just would never do that. That's a, that's a step I don't believe you need. With so. um, With doing channel separations like that, I mean, we do it basically based on the artwork. If it comes in vector, then that's great. But if it um, if it is built in Photoshop, we don't necessarily vectorize it either. Right. Do you like some of those software separation companies mm -hmm. like um, like Separation Studio and AccuRip, or do you like to do it just a hundred percent inside of Photoshop uh, uh, and then send it out? I'm an old school dude, man. I do it the yeah. way that I've always done it, which is using LAB to create the underbase, use the L channel. And then I create my channels, and uh, boop, I'm done. And uh, actually, a lot of times when I'm designing, I'm designing and separating as I'm working. But if someone was to send me a file, I, I would separate it that way. Uh, I like control. I, I, uh, I've, I'm, a, I'm a guy in Photoshop. I use curves. I like the info palette. Uh, I like mm -hmm. my pointer to be a three by three pixel sample average, and uh, I want. And then another thing that I want is, uh, if you know how the shop is going to print, you know, for example, w how small of a half tone can they keep? So if you've got a gradation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, do they blow it out at twelve percent, right? It, you need to take that into account when you're doing the steps, right? So that's a conversation we should have about how small of a half tone you can you can hold, right? And that has a lot to do with how you're imaging, how you're exposing your cr screen room craftsmanship, all that stuff, right? Um, and so, um, you know, I want to dial that in for what is achievable on press. Uh, and um, it, that's just how I think as a designer, you know, and um, so I knew that when I was doing back way back when I, when I was an art director, I knew all that for the shop I was working at. Right. And uh, Gavin, do you get into that when you're doing steps for people? Do you ask 
how small of a half tone they can hold and all that. Uh, that way they can replicate what you're actually separating. Yeah, so when we onboarding the customer, the customer uh, has to fill out what we call a profile, and we have that conversation, hey, what is the halftone that you can hold? What's your, um, do you even have a rip? Because some customers don't even have a rip, right? Do you want pre-manufactured halftone, or are you going to have, let the rip does it yourself? Every right. customer is a little bit different. So normally that happens when the customer would come in, hey, uh, sometimes they could provide us with a sample and the sample, hey, this is something that I printed was really good, just mirror that, or they'll be like, hey, we want you to take the lead. Yeah, it, it all happens in the front end, uh, just trying to figure all that out and then build like a profile and then pass that to the graphic designer for the graphic designer to um, you know, duplicate uh, it. An interesting thing just, you might think about is is give them a test file to print to see what they're able to achieve, right? Mm -hmm. With a gradation scale and maybe some different line weights and, you yeah. know, a printed E-scale, you know. Uh, I don't know if you guys know what an E-scale is, but back when you used to do typography, you had an actual scale with the letter E and all different point sizes, and then what can you hold, you know, and... Mm -hmm. um, so it's just a, uh, you know, and I think there's a lot of different levels of craftsmanship in this industry, and yeah. uh, it's really funny looking online in forums at, at the total amount of wrong answers that people give. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they swear up and down, this is the way to do it, and it's like, okay, why are you yeah. saying that, right? So Yeah. Um, yeah, there's spe a lot of ways to get some sort of product out, even if it might be a pretty difficult way to get there. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, and one thing I found, like every shop, like just going through every shop, handle a uh, same process differently. Every shop, right? Because again, like, could you hold uh, certain dots on your screen? How uh, good is your screen making process, right? Yeah. Um, so it's really like a, it's not a one size fit all. It really has to be like a very um, granular thing that you, hey, this is what I like yeah. um, right. when it comes down to it. Yep. So the, the way I've always thought of it is uh, there's a rule of four with half tones, right? So you multiply your dot size by four to get your screen that you you should be using you know and what we used all the time was a 63.4 angle 50 line dot elliptical shape and we would use 230s mm -hmm. and it was the it was perfect right and we wouldn't get, ever get more a and uh you know an easy way to check if your actual rip software is printing the angle is just to instead of printing a screen print it on a piece of paper and then you can just use a protractor that you buy a target for a dollar fifty and measure the angle and is it the same angle that you've <laughs> entered into your rip right and and sometimes it's not right and so uh, that's what you need to be doing so yeah uh, yeah definitely let's um let's talk a so you and i we've done some work together with uh consultant and one thing I'm going to say, just like that kind of really helped me out a lot. And it, uh, so I want to, maybe you could touch up on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Is you introduced to me this thing that you call like four sheet of, I'm not exact, I'm not sure the, the term that oh, you gave it, but like four. The four sheets of paper. The four sheets yeah. of paper. I would love for you to just talk about that. To me, that was like, uh, it really, really helped me when I was like in a, uh, tough situation uh, yeah. with some people. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, talk about that. So the four sheets of paper uh, is an exercise that you can do with a problematic employee. Maybe this is somebody that you've had challenges before and you're at your wits end and you know that you need to have a really tough conversation. So the idea mm -hmm. behind this is that you're talking about the outcome and what we want to be is outcome forward, right? So. Uh, the four sheets of paper is something that you do with the employee in a meeting. 
And so the idea here is that the first sheet of paper is for you to fill out about what the situation is. So uh, let's say they're late a lot or they, um, they are making lots of mistakes or I don't know what the problem is, but you write down exactly what you want them to do, right? They need to show up on time or they, whatever it is. They, like you're exactly very specific about it and the reason why it's wrong, everything is on that first sheet of paper about what the situation and the problem is. It's all on there. It's all documented. And you and the employee agree that this is the totality of the situation. Okay. The second piece of paper is what do they need to be able to accomplish what's on page one? Right? So they need special training. Do they need some tools? Do they need more time? Do they need what? Do, whatever they need. They need a new computer. They need a new cell phone. I mean, whatever it is, you're agreeing that you'll get them whatever they need to, to hit the first page. Yeah. Okay? The third page is what happens if the first page is accomplished? Okay, now you can set a date or it's just a general thing or whatever, but what happens with the employee if they get the, the all, whatever the problem is on page one fixed, right? Do they get a raise? Do they get a bonus? Do they get a trip to Hawaii? Do they get to keep their job, <laughs> right? <laughs> Probably the last whatever, one. <laughs> whatever the thing is, right? What do they get? What's the, what's the uh, carrot you're dangling out there, right? Mm -hmm. And of course, the fourth piece of paper is what happens if they don't do it okay they lose their job they you know they they get demoted uh, you know whatever right something's going to happen if they don't hit the first page now what happens with this is that either they're going to be on track i like to have things by a date and we've got multiple benchmark meetings or you know things set up there you know we're looking at progress and we should see progress we might have an occasional problem or two but we're working through that and by this date the thing gets either accomplished or not and what i'll tell you is either the peop the person works works it out or they self-terminate because they can see i'm not going to hit that october 10th deadline because it's already August and I've failed three times, I know I'm going to be fired. I'm just going to look for a new job, see it. And, and the, the beauty of this is the fact that they self-terminate, then you don't have to pay all the worker, uh, you know, dividends, you know, all that stuff, right? It's just like they've quit and you're done, right? And so that solved, that prevents you from having to fire them and, um, and they make the decision for you. Right. And um, so it's an easier conversation to have when they do it. <laughs> so um, but the, the, the thing here that I want to stress is that you're managing people with clarity. You're def you're defining the outcome. You're setting the expectations that are crystal clear, um, because here's what I'll tell you is a lot of people. They don't know what the right thing is. You think they know just because they walk through the door that they've learned this stuff by osmosis just because they're here and present. Mm -hmm. They know what the right thing is. And a lot of times the answer is they don't know because you haven't been clear. You're clear as mud, right? By doing stuff like this, you make it really easy for them to decipher what is the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. Uh, because you're actually having a conversation about it. They're signing their name to the piece of paper. And, and this completely obliterates any confusion. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's really the good. four I always, pieces of paper. I, I struggle with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I enjoy the management side of <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, uh, I, I have a habit of bringing people in and kind of just keeping the people that thrive. Um, <laughs> But I, I certainly don't have like clear boundaries or clear guidelines when people first come in. It's normally like, okay, you're going to scrub these screens for the next, you know, month. And then we kind of just see how they go. But they're not necessarily getting like an outlined thing. And it's probably unfair that they're not getting some sort of path forward where, you know, if you prove yourself in this position, there's an opportunity in this direction or that direction. Um, well, so, yeah, it's really yeah. good advice. 
So the, the problem with that, Cole, right, is that mm -hmm. uh, you're creating your own turnover problem because people can't see their career trajectory because right. nobody wants to do dishes forever, right? That's, mm -hmm. not a, that's not a fun job unless you're one of these people who really loves to run the, uh, the pressure washer because there's people like that. They get a lot of joy out of spraying that thing, right? And, uh, and we want those people there, right? And... Um, yeah. So it's like if you have clarity on what it means to be uh, a catcher, a press operator, an inker, an art person, a salesperson, you know, marketing, whatever. What does it mean to be entry level? And then what does it mean to be level two or whatever? And how do you advance? And when am I having a raise? And, you know, all of that stuff should be detailed and very specific about it. And it, everybody should know what the expectations are. So if you want to be at this level, if you want this raise, these are the things you've got to do to earn it. We don't like reward people just because you've been here 10 years. That's silly. We reward you because you have this knowledge. You have this skill. This is your error rate. You know, you're a seventh degree black belt samurai ninja level printer. Do you deserve the money? Right? Oh, do you cost us eight thousand dollars a year in mistakes because you don't care? You don't deserve the money, right? And why are you still here? Actually, so you know. Um, so the clearer that we can be with this stuff, the expectations we have, the better off that we're going to be, and the easier it is to manage. Because I'll tell you, varsity players want to play with varsity players. And yep. when you finally get around to cutting the person who just wasn't, wasn't fitting in and wasn't doing the work, everybody goes, gosh, Cole, how come you didn't fire Mary sooner? Gosh, it's so what yeah. a great relief that you did that, right? Because yeah, That's like, exactly what I do. Yeah. And have you, <laughs> have you heard that before? Well, I just fired two people last week. <laughs> yeah? Yeah. And did yeah, you I'm hear from your staff? Hey, thank God they're gone. Did you hear that comment? Oh, I had long conversations about how I was a, uh, uh, well, they didn't say the word wussy uh, <laughs> for not firing them. And so I, I always had, a, there was a reason every single day to not fire them. Because in the, in the meantime, it's going to end up falling on me. And so in that meantime, there was always a reason why, okay, they're going to help knock out this and that. And then I'll be in a good enough spot for them to leave. And then yeah. now the next morning, oh, we didn't quite finish this and that. So now they have to do this. And, oh, there's a rush that's due in two days. So now they're going to help with the rush. Then I'll have a reason to have them go. Yeah. And uh, there was always a reason. And then basically in the last week and a half with them gone, I've just been showing up like an hour and a half early. And I'm doing their entire day's work. And so it's like, what was I waiting for other than just yeah. being a wussy? I so, don't know what it was. Uh, something you might think about is just hiring the replacement and getting them trained up and you're paying two yeah. people. And then now you, there's no excuses to not hiring them because Billy is here and you can fire Fred. It's easy. Yeah. So, um, you know, I'm tempted but, to just hire Gavin again, but we can talk to Gavin. <laughs> One of the people was my art person. So it, it might be a thing where just having outsourcing some of the tasks um, yeah. another thing that Gavin's amazing at is he's really good at remote workers and I would one of the people that got fired was in the office doing things like quotes which I don't really believe needs to be in person mm -hmm. um, so that kind of stuff can be really interesting as a cost, cost saving measure and also it seems like Gavin gets a lot of productivity out of the people that work for him remotely whereas I'll have people who insist on being 40 hours a week but yet when I walk in on them, they don't seem to be busy. Um, so yeah, I, I really want to replace these people on a completely different level than what I was doing with them before. So do you have v VAs, Cole? At the moment, I have none, but G Gavin has some for the podcast that I've been speaking to, and they just seem yeah. to be really responsive. So I have a VA. She's worked for me for over two years, and she's mm -hmm. awesome. Her name's Lyra. Uh, and uh, we actually, I go through a company called Legacy Virtual, who is a Shirt Lab sponsor. Say hi to them. Oh, cool. And um, and they actually are placing a lot of VAs in industry shops. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, and actually, I've worked with them to detail the processes that a uh, 
you know, this industry kind of needs. And uh, to me, a VA is really great for anything yeah. that you yeah. need that where I don't actually have to be here. They don't, they obviously can't clean a screen, but they can put mm -hmm. an order in, they could do social mm -hmm. media, they can do order acknowledgements, they could do tracking numbers, they could do um, marketing, they could do like a gazillion things that you don't have to yeah. be there for, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, in my VA, Lyra, she does my personal stuff, she does mid journey, my mid journey newsletter stuff, she does shirt lab stuff, she does a lot of things and she totally kicks ass. Um, and these are dedicated, smart, capable people. They just yeah. live on the other side of the planet, right? Yeah. And, um, you know, so I would look into that and, uh, you know, whatever service you use. Now, just like any employee, they have to mm -hmm. be trained. You have to take care mm -hmm. of them. You have to have discussions. You have to be personally engaged with them. You have to pay them. You, you've got, you just like any employee, right? They're just not going to just like know instantly what to do. You've got to start and work up, right? And yeah. so that's important. Um, uh, so, this question, this follow up question for both of you is then, uh, how do you know how long something is truly taking them and how do you? Who cares? Get the right result you would want. It doesn't I mean, matter. Like, like if they tell matter. me they spent an entire day on a quote versus what should have been, okay. you know, an hour and a half on on something complicated. Well, how do you even adjust for that? Well, that's how do you, you guys handle. That's it? you, Cole, going. Hey, uh, right now we're starting at zero. When you get going with this, this should take you ten minutes. Right. Yeah. And so I'm going to say, okay, at ten minutes times twenty. Da, 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 da. This is how many you should be able to do by lunch or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And um, so it's so to me, it's all about the outcome. Like, what what are you wanting from your your VA? Like, I just give Lyra a, a giant pile of stuff to do. I don't care how long it takes her to do it because she's got to do it all. Yeah. So, does she have some sort of set salary from you? She has, she makes a, an hourly wage that the company oh. that she works for pays, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm, I am billed and then uh, for that. And then I give her bonuses and stuff. Like I just gave her a bonus last week, right? So um, totally unexpected, just me being a nice guy bonus, <laughs> right? Yeah. And because I want her motivated and happy, right? It, just like any yeah. employee. So... Um, you know, and but uh, she has things that she's got to do every day. She's keeps track of stuff for me. I mean, if like y you might look at what I do online on social media, okay, I haven't posted anything in two years, Cole. <laughs> and it's all it's just all managed. Somebody's by doing that for me. Yeah, huh. I don't. Yeah. I can do stuff like this podcast because I'm not worrying about what's on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Cole, actually, you asked that question about maybe like two months ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> and um, it, it kind of stuck with me because, like, uh, I've been wrestling with that for a while because, you know, I deal with, I, I deal with uh, a lot of the overseas folks. And there's two, there's two camp, right? There's a camp that says, hey, I completely trust you. You take care of it. Of course, you could see what's going on, right? And then there's another camp. Well, I need to, like, literally micromanage what you do, right? And I did not want to be in that camp where I micromanage what you do. But I also don't think being on the, on the camp where you just kind of, like, hope and wish they get it done is the right approach. And Cole, because of that question you asked about two months ago, it really like just sucked me down this like little, I went and like researched different ways to try to like handle this, right? And what we've been doing lately is like, what is that high, like that hybrid where our people still feel value, our people, I'm not overlooking their, uh, over their shoulder, recording their screen or whatever, but also gives me control gives me visibility gives me uh what i need to run a business and yeah we've been able to find something that kind of like uh where they could almost self-report but on a more 
every project that they're working on, right? And you could see that. So I think that's a good approach where um, you're you're still giving the people the freedom, but as a business, you still need to be able to see, especially for our business, our uh, we still need to be able to see what's going on, right? Now, generally, when it comes to VA, um, I think every shop owner should have a VA by like, working for them. I remember when I first got my when I got my first VA, I was it was a such a breath of fresh air because I had an in person assistant. That in person assistant cost me a lot of money. They wasn't doing half mm-hmm. the things I wanted them to do. I remember I went to deliver a job to a customer. I came back. The person was had their feet up on the table and watching YouTube. I'm like, that's crazy. So no. it really gave <laughs> it. It really gave me the motivation to just like go down this uh, VA thing. And when I found them, I was like, yeah, a lot of these folks, if you uh, could find the right people, they will do so much more work for you, and they'll do it like you could feel the that they're committed, right? And you could feel their uh, uh, that they're genuine. At the same time, you still have to be able to be a good manager. I think it's a great opportunity for somebody that hasn't managed people. You could like get your management chops through a virtual assistant because they're not going to cost you as much. And if you make a mistake, it doesn't like uh, it may not like ruin your business. So you have less risk uh, to like really just kind of test different things and. What I've been finding is like, is you really just limited by your creativity and the work that you want to do, like the, on what you want to do. Like if you want them to do different things and you're willing to invest with them and you're willing to just kind of just hold their hand for a little bit, at, at a certain point, they'll just take it and run and do a lot better. But at, in the beginning, there is some investment. And I think a lot of time that's what investment and time Investment and in just making sure your business is clean. Investment in making sure that your systems are good. Because that, if not, they're they're not going to be able to produce for you. Because if it's chaotic, they won't be able to produce. So that upfront work you got to be able to do. So you're saying there's no hope for me? <laughs> I got you, Cole. I got you. <laughs> I'll steal Christine. Uh, so, so uh, Marshall. I, Besides just the VA thing, what do you see out of successful shops, whether they're big or small, as far as um, handling and managing customer service and sales? Well, I think the most important thing you can do is identify your ideal customer. And if you Mm -hmm. start with that, everything works out. I think a lot of people make the mistake of they'll just do anything, right? And the problem with doing anything is you fill up your schedule with a lot of low profit, like not like ideal orders, and you're working with customers that they're more transactional and that you're not in alignment with them. So what I would do, uh, I can tell you because I've asked this question a gazillion times, probably about, I don't know, 60 or 70 percent of this industry is operating without a business plan. So they have a moving target. They have no idea who their ideal customer is, how frequently they order, what is their best order, what is the best order for the shop, where they make money, what is their ideal gross and net profit. They don't know this stuff because they haven't done the work. And what they do is they build what I call the field of dreams mentality, which is if you build it, they will come, right? If I get an auto, I'll get orders, you know, and that's far from the truth. You have to be doing things. And also a lot of people uh, sit like a spider in a web waiting for customers to call instead of aggressively going out and hunting for new business with their business plan in mind. So if, for example, if you want more 500 piece orders, what sales actions are you doing that's going to drive 500 piece minimum orders? So if you just sit there and wait for stuff, all you get is these 60 piece orders and 48 piece orders or whatever, because you're not going out there and looking for those 500 piece orders, you're never going to get to what you want because you're not actually doing the work. And so this is why, I'm sorry. Go ahead, finish. 
Oh, I, I was just going to expand on the outside sales element. Like, what do you think is a good way to approach outside sales and bring in those big orders without just cold calling, you know, the, the well, front it's, desk girl? It's everything. How do you normally handle that? Well, well, it depends on the customer, right? So who mm -hmm. is your ideal customer? Let's say your ideal customer is a hospital, right? And you want, because they have 2,000 employees and they do all these Habitat for Humanity and uh, cancer walks, and they order a lot of promo, they order a lot of stuff, they order, they, they will be a, 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 a you know, th that's a three hundred, four hundred thousand dollar a year client easy, okay? Yep. Getting it is the challenge. So are you gonna post mm -hmm. on Instagram and get a hospital? No, you're gonna have to align yourself up with the HR department or the marketing department. A lot of these people have an agency. So you got to learn how to get in with that to be able to learn to sell the hospital by getting in there and asking questions and going after it. They're not coming to you. You have to go get them, right? right? So to me, it depends on the customer, right? Uh, you know, and... Um, it's that's why a business plan is the thing that where you need to start because it's research based it's based on data it's based on market surveys it's based on your experiences you might already have an ideal customer right but a really great thing to do and i i talk about this all the time so it's not really a new thing is to do an 80 20 deep dive on your current customers you know um your top 20 percent of your customers give you 80% of your revenue, right? Yeah. This is absolutely true right now. So you've got QuickBooks, you've whatever program you're using, uh, export that and sort it by customer with total sales. And you'll see that your top 20% of your customers give you the lion's share of the money that's coming in. The other side of that coin is that you've got 80% of your customers, okay, uh, that only give you 20% of your money. This is why your production schedule is full of crap, right? This is all mm -hmm. that stuff that you're taking that you don't need to be. This is why you're having to start a second shift and you're not making any profit, okay? It's because you're targeting the wrong customers. So this is why if you don't have a business plan, if you don't really know who and what you're going after, then how do you know how to build it? How do you know how to market? How do you know what to do? So this is where the thinking part of things really needs to happen because if you do more thinking and less reaction, you'll, uh, you'll be proactively going after your ideal customer and you could have a better result. It's not guaranteed, of course, but you'll have a better chance of it because you're actually aiming. It's like a bullseye, you know? If you want to hit the bullseye, you have to aim. It's the same thing in business. If you want a certain type of customer, you have to aim your marketing and your sales effort and your customer service effort at that customer. Otherwise, you'll never get the result. And any result that you get, it's probably just luck more than anything, right? Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I don't want my business relying on luck to be successful. Uh, yeah, which I mean, is why I certainly... Go ahead. Yeah, it's hard for me to shut up sometimes, which is, which is why <laughs> a, a lot of times, a lot of times, you know, people reach a certain level and they can't get to the next level in their brain. What's the next level, right? Mm -hmm. That's why there's That's plenty so of 600 or $700,000 shops. They can't get to a million because what has gotten them there, uh, what has gotten them there, it only goes so far. You know, yeah. so kind of going off of that with the, you know, your best clients, um, what I've experienced in the past is there's been clients where like a single client is $300,000 worth of work and they can really suck up a lot of your time. Um, and they're also a reason at different points in our history why we expanded. Um, but then also sometimes when it's not even your fault, but just like they change their marketing budget or they change the way that they create their uh, apparel because now they're just going overseas even though you didn't mess up their production, but they just grew into the point of going overseas. Um, in those kind of situations, how do you see shops successfully managing that giant hole in revenue? Because um, I've seen that a lot where companies are just far too uh, focused on a single client or one or two clients and losing them can just decimate their, uh, their general production. For me, getting those big customers are, I think, is a lot more riskier. 
It's a lot riskier with a big customer than, say, a medium-sized customer that is your ideal customer. Because if that big customer decides to leave, yeah, you've already made the investment. They don't care. Like, you right. still got this press that you got to pay for. You still have these people that you got to pay for. You can't just go and fire these people just because of that. Maybe you can, but it wouldn't be the right thing to do. So, um uh yeah. i don't think um any customer that's too big is i don't think you should get them in my opinion well i mean the thing is like it's just so easy you know like if <laughs> like we're doing um i don't think it would matter if i say who it is but we're doing uh a big bakery in southern california um and so they are doing an order that's over 30k and They'll put another order in in two months or so. And uh, that's the kind of clients I want because I'm going to print like just their logo on all of these items that are going to be given away or be given to staff. And mm -hmm. then I'm going to, I, I buy all the blanks. I run all the order. It's honestly not that much work um, considering we have autos. So like I'm maybe, maybe going to dedicate like a two days to it as far as production. Um, so getting those types of clients is awesome. But then the problem is when that kind of client goes away for any number of reasons, yeah. you're, you went from being nice and cushy with, you know, oh, I'm just pulling in whatever, a hundred and something thousand from this client to I'm a hundred thousand in the hole as far as gross revenue. Yeah. And all I can end up managing to find is new clients that want 50 pieces. So like finding that great client is always the goal as opposed to, because I could do... I mean, for thirty thousand plus dollars in sales, that could be twenty five orders, or it could be only their one order. Yeah. So it's like you know, when I'm making money a thousand dollars at a time, I, I would much rather have the big client. Um, yeah. And it's just so much less work as far as setup and sales and all that, just time consuming with like approvals, all this back and forth. Or I can have yeah. one great client. Um, so yeah, it's an interesting thing to try to find that balance. Yeah, it is. And especially if you're trying to build your business. So let's say you want to try to build your business to sell it. Like from what I heard, uh, most people that's buying businesses, they don't want that where one customer has complete control over your business this way. Right. right. They want you to have a balanced book of business, uh, a decent size, not like on the smallish, but decent size. So I think then that should be the focus. Hey, where, how do I get these? What is that ideal uh, ticket or uh, average money I want to make per order? Like, let that be the driver, right? Hey, uh, every order, if we could be, keep it around three to five thousand dollars, right? That's like the sweet spot, or whatever. Um, if you can, whatever that happened to be, and then I, I, just like Marshall was saying, I think yeah. that would give you some clarity. Then you could start answering those questions. Hey, what customers could it? Uh, do that for me maybe a restaurant maybe uh, this hospital that he was talking about maybe a construction company you know because you could kind mm -hmm. of uh just drop names into that bucket and then you could just try to go out and strategize trying to get those customers absolutely yeah. well it seems like we're probably not going to get marshall back so i believe we're going to conclude the episode but we want to thank marshall so much for uh, being on the episode. And we're going to link to his website and Shirt Lab's website so that you can follow him and connect with him if you're looking for any advice yeah. on your print shop. And uh, thanks so much for listening. Please like, subscribe, and tell your mom about us. We'll see you next Later. time. Peace.